Okay. Um, sorry it took me so long to upload this time. As you can see, I was changing some things around. Uh, but I finally get back to it. So, chapter seven. Well, I think it's underneath the gray house. Yes, look how the burglars tried to take up the floor. But they were looking for the map, not the grail. No, they weren't. Remember what Great Uncle Mary said? They didn't know what they were looking for, nor did he. It might have been a clue to it, like the map, or might have been the thing itself. Well, the clue was there. Why shouldn't the thing itself be there as well? But look, idiot, Simon said, unrolling the map. The grey house isn't marked. There isn't even a blodge. It just wasn't there then. Remember our Cornish man lived 900 years ago. Oh. They were sitting on the grass halfway up the Kemmer, Kem, halfway up Kemmer, Kemmer head. Kemmer? Hmm. At the side of one of the rough trodden tracks, which ran zigzagging up its slope, Great Uncle Mary had left them on their own. A day's grace to find the first clue, he said. Will I draw off the hounds? Just one piece of advice. Don't start till the afternoon. Spend the morning on the beach or something. Then you'll be sure the hounds are gone. Then he had gone out fishing for the day with Father, who was intent on trying a part of the sea off a headland a mile down the coast. And sure enough, as their small boat powdered out of the harbor with Father at the tiller and Great Uncle Mary towering stiff-backed in the bow bows, the yacht Lady Mary, gleaming white in the sun, had within minutes moved silently out after them, her engine purring faintly over the quiet morning sea. Watching from the house, they had seen her sails gradually unfurl and billow as she came into the bay. She took a wide course out to sea, but one from which Great Uncle Mary and Father would have, uh, would always be just in sight. Up on the headland now, the afternoon sun prickled their bare legs, and there was a small breeze. Oh dear, Jane said despondently, edging a blade of grass from its sheath and nibbling. This is hopeless. We just don't know where to start. Perhaps we should go back to where we were yesterday. But we know what things look like from there. Well, so what? Well, so what? Which things? Well, the headland and the sea and the sun and those so stones up on the top there. Barney gestured vaguely above their heads up, up the slope. I think they've got something to do with it. The Cornish man must have been able to see them. Gmary says they're three hundred they're wow, they're three thousand years old, so they must have so they have been almost as ancient looking nine hundred years ago as they are now. You can certainly see them clear enough from the other side, Simon sat up interested. But they're such a long way across, Jane pointed out. I mean, the first clue might have been that you had to take have to take ten paces to your left or something. It always is in stories about buried p treasure, but to get to the stand, but to get to the standing stones up here from over there, you'd have to take thousands of paces right across the harbor. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to be like that, Simon said. It could be could be the thing like compass bearings again. You know, perhaps we have to get in line with. Get something in line with something else to lead us on to a third thing. Barney closed his eyes and screwed up his face, trying to bring back a picture of the scene they had gazed at so hard the evening before. Do you remember when the sun was setting yesterday, he said slowly. The biggest standing stone was right bang in line with the sun from where we were. I remember because you could only see it if you didn't look right at it, if you see what I mean. Simon looked closely at the manuscript again, excitement beginning to dawn on his face. Do you know? I think you got something there. This round thing drawn here over the standing stones that we thought was just decoration. Perhaps it's supposed to be the sun. I mean, if he knew the map wouldn't be found for years and years, he'd have to use signs like the sun that wouldn't be likely to change. Come on, then. Yeah, come on, then. Let's go further up and look, Jane said. Eager. Jane jumped eagerly to her feet, and then suddenly she froze, rock still, stock still. Simon, quick, she said quietly in a strained, tight voice. Put the map away. Hide it. Simon frowned. What on earth? Quickly, it's Miss Withers. She's coming up the path and someone else is with her. They'll be right on top of us in a minute. Simon hastily rolled up the manuscript and stuffed it into his rucksack. Who is it with her? He hissed. I can't see. Yes, I can. Jane turned quick, turned away quickly as if 
it hurt her to look, then sat down again. She was very flushed. It's that boy, the one who knocked me over. I knew he was mixed up in all this somehow. They heard voices then, coming nearer up the slope. Miss Withers' clear tones floated up to them. I don't care, Bill. We have to check on everything. He may already have... Then she was on them, silhouetted against the skyline, and she stopped short was as she saw the three children all sitting looking expressionlessly up at her. The boy stopped too, glowering. For a moment, Miss Withers stood with her mouth slightly open, taken aback. Then she pulled herself together and flashed a smile at them. Well, she said pleasantly, coming forward, what a surprise, all the Drew family at once. I hope you boys didn't feel too tired after all that sea air we gave you the other day. Not a bit, thank you. Barney said in his clearest, most public voice. "'It's a marvelous boat,' Simon said, equally distant and polite. "'And what are you all doing up here?' Miss Withers inquired quite innocently. She was wearing slacks with a sleeveless white blouse that made her arms look very brown, and her dark hair tumbled by the breeze. was tumbled by the breeze. She looked very attractive and healthy. She glanced at Jane expectedly. Jane gulped. "'We were just looking at the sea. We saw your boat go out this morning.' We thought you'd be to, you'd be on board her, Simon added, without thinking. A flicker of weariness crossed Polly Withers' face. She said easily, Ah, I'm not the best of sailors, as I probably told you. Simon looked deliberately down at the sea. It lay as flat and unrippled as a pond. Miss Withers said, following his gaze, Ah, it'll blow up later. You mark my words. Oh, Simon said. His face was expressionless still, but there was the faintest note of insolent disbelief in his tone. For the first time, Miss Withers' smile faded slightly. Before she could say anything, the boy with her spoke. Miss... okay. Miss Polly always be right about the sea. Always be right about the sea, he said gruffly, glaring at Simon. She do know more about n than they old men down there put together. He jerked his head contemptuously down at the harbor. I'm so sorry. Oh, I haven't introduced you, Miss Withers said brightly. Do forgive me. Jane, Simon, Barnabas, this is Bill, our right-hand man. Without him, the Lady Mary couldn't do a thing. The boy flushed darkly and looked down at his grubby sneakers after a quick glance up at Jane. Jane thought pityingly. He thinks she's wonderful. We've met before, Simon said shortly. Barney said, how is your bicycle? How is your bicycle? No better for your asking, the boy snapped. Watch your manners, Bill. Through the sweet smile, Mrs. Miss Withers' voice was cold and tight as a steel wire. That's not the way we speak to our friends. Bill looked at her in sullen reproach, jerked forward and went, up, went on up the path without a word. Oh dear, Miss Withers sighed. Now I've heard his feelings. These village people are so touchy. She made a charming conspiratorial grimace at them. I suppose I'd better go after him. She turned to follow the boy, then quickly swung around again. The words shot out like a flick of lightning. Have you found a map? For a moment of roaring silence that seemed like an hour, they stared at her. And then Barney, driven by pure naked alarm, took refuge in gabbling nonsense. Did you say a map, Miss Withers? Or was it a gap? We did find a gap in the hedge, down there, and that was how we got through up to the headland. But we haven't got a map. At least I haven't. I don't know about Simon and Jane. Don't you know your way up the hill? Miss Withers, staring fixedly at them, relaxed into friends friendliness again. Yes, that's right, Barnabas, a map. I don't know my way about all that well. As a matter of fact, I couldn't find a map anywhere in the shops this morning. There's a one there's one little footpath I'm looking for, just over the other side, and Bill isn't very much help. I believe Great Uncle Mary has a map, Jane said vaguely. She was watching closely from the corner of her eye, but not a muscle moved in Miss Withers' face. You haven't met our great uncle, have you, Miss Withers? He's gone out fishing with father today. What a pity. I'm awfully sorry we can't help. I do hope you're fi you find your way, Simon said kindly. Well, well, I suspect, I expect I shall, Miss Withers said. She flashed her brightest smile at them and turned away up the path, raising her hand. Goodbye, all of you. They watched in silence until she disappeared over the line, where the slope met the sky. Then Barney flung himself face down on the ground and rolled over and over, letting out a long, relieved breath. Whew, how awful.
awful. When she suddenly said, he buried his face in the glass, in the grass. Do you think she realizes? Jane said anxiously to Simon. Did we give it away? I don't know. Simon gazed thoughtfully at the quiet green slope. There was no sign now, there now of Miss Withers, or of anything except one far away grazing sheep. I don't think so. I mean, we all must have looked pretty silly when she asked about a map. I know you did. So did you, like a fish. All right. Well, we could perfectly well have looked surprised anyway, her saying it out of the blue like that. I don't think she'd be able to tell if we were looking guilty or just startled, I, I expect. He added, gaining confidence as he went on. She believes we really did think she just wanted an ordinary map to find her way. Perhaps that's all she did want. No fear. No fear, Barney said, emerging from the grass. She was testing us out, all right. Otherwise, why, why did she say found? Have you found a map? Any normal person would have said, I say, have you got a map? He's quite right, Simon said, rubbing the dust from his legs. Great Uncle Mary was right, too. They aren't taking chances. Miss Withers was surprised to see us, you could tell, but it wasn't five seconds before she was having a go about the map. It was nasty altogether, Jane said, wriggling her shoulders as if she could shake off the memory. She looked up the slope. How can we go on up there now? We shan't be able to tell if she and that horrible boy are hidden away somewhere, watching everything we do. Well, it's no good letting that stop us, Simon stuck his out his chin. If we think about being watched, we shall never do anything. So long as we behave normally, as if we were just wandering about, it ought to be all right. He picked up his rucksack. Come on. The side of Kemmer Head was steeper than the opposite headland had been, and for a long time... As they toiled up the zigzag path, they saw nothing above them but the line of the slope against the sky, and the sun blazing down into their eyes. The end of the headland, rocky and grey, stretched out far beyond them into the sea, and sweeping towards it, the land looked immensely solid, as if it were rock and soil, and the soil above it no more than skin. Then a skin, yeah. And then they were at the top of the slope where the grass grew short in a gra great dry green sweep, and they could see the standing stones. As they drew nearer, the stones seemed to grow, pointing silently to the sky like vast tombstones set on end. Stones, Simon said. It's the biggest understatement I've ever heard. It's like calling Nelson's column a stick. He stood considering the giant granite pillars rising above them. Above him, there were four of them, one much, one much higher than the rest, and the other three grouped irregularly around it. Perhaps the grail is buried under one of those, Barney said tentatively. It can't be. They're too old. Anyway, I think you're wrong about it being buried. Oh, come on. It must be, Jane said. How else could anything stay hidden all that time? And remember that bit about the manuscript, said Barney, over sea and under stone. Simon rubbed his ear, still dissatisfied. We aren't over the sea here. The sea's miles away. Well, all right, not miles, but I bet it's 400 yards to the end of the headland. Well, we're still above the sea, aren't we? I'm not sure that's what he meant. Over sea, over sea, I, I wonder. Anyway, we're trying to go too fast. Step by step, Gamary said. We ought to stick to the step we're on. Simon looked at the sun, gradually sinking over the coast, where cliff after cliff carved into the mist beyond Khmer Head. Have a look at the stones. The sun will be as low as it was yesterday soon. They look so different when you're close. Jane wandered around the weather-beaten gray pillars of rock. We want, to know which we want to know which one it was that looked in a line with the sun from the other side, isn't that it? But how do we find that out from here. It was the biggest one, Barney said. It stood up higher than the rest. The sun glowed deep toward the horizon, casting a long, an orange, an orange gold warmth over their faces. Look at the shadows, Simon said suddenly. A shadow on the ground before him moved a long arm, dapple-edged by the grass, as he pointed. 
That's the way we can do it from this side. Backwards. If one stone was directly between us and the sun yesterday, that means that from here its shadow would be pointing directly from directly to where we were standing then. Look towards the rock Gamera was sitting against. Look, you can just see it from here. Following his arm, they saw one chunky rock on the opposite headland, a faraway bump on its skyline, a lit lit bright by the gold of the setting sun. It was higher than the standing stones on Khmer Head and further out towards the sea, but it was undoubtedly the spot where they had stood the day before. Jane gazed at Simon in open and unusual admiration. He flushed slightly and became very brisk. Come on, Barney. Quickly, before the sun goes. Which stone do you think it was? Well, it was the biggest one, so it must have been this one. Barney moved a yard or two downhill to the tallest stone. He crossed to its other side, facing the harbour, and crouched down in the shadow, peering at the stone across the bay. He frowned doubtfully. Simon and Jane moved to one side of him, waiting impatiently. Barney, his frown deepening, suddenly lay down on his stomach in the grass, so that he was lying along the line of the pointing shadow and looked straight ahead. Am I lying straight? Am I lying straight? He said, rather muffled. Yes, yes, dead straight. Is it the right one? Barney scrambled to his feet, looking doleful. No, that shadow doesn't point exactly at the rock. You can see the rock clearly enough, but you have to shift your eyes slightly to be looking straight at it, and that's cheating. But you said it was the tallest stone you saw. I still say it was. I don't see how that could have been, Jane said, petulant with disappointment. Simon was thinking hard, holding the rucksack, swinging by its strap and banging it absently against his leg. He turned and looked back at the other three stones, standing black now, with gold rimmed against the blaze of the sun. Then he yelped, dropped the rucksack, and rushed towards the furthest stone, scrambling down as Barney had done to lie in its shadow. Holding his breath, he dropped his chin to the grass and shut his eyes. Move your top half a bit to the left. You're not straight, Jane said, close beside him, beginning to understand. Simon shifted a few inches, raising himself on his elbows. That right? Okay. Simon crossed his fingers and opened his eyes. Straight in front of him, over the blades of grass, right in the middle of his line of vision, a bright, sunlit rock on the opposite headland was staring him in the face. This is the one, he said in a curiously subdued voice. Barney rushed to cross and dropped down beside him. Let me, let me! He elbowed Simon out of the way and squinted across the harbor at the rock. You're right, he said rather reluctantly. But it was the biggest stone that I saw. I know it was. That's right, said Jane. What do you mean, that's right? Look at the way the stones are put up. Look at the way the ground slopes. This is at the top of the headland, but it isn't flat. And the big stone is lower th down than the others. The one you're next to now is higher up on the hill, even though it's not the tallest. So if you saw its outline against the sky yesterday, it looked as if it were the tallest. Gosh, said Barney. I never thought of that. Simon said loftily. I thought you might get there in the end. It was jolly clever of you, Jane said. If you hadn't been so quick, we might never have realized. The shadows will be gone soon. She pointed down at the grass. I have a cat that wants up on my lap. Hold on. No? Are you, are you changing your mind? Well. Come on, then. Come on. There he goes. It's Gulliver time. Hi. Yes. Alright. Okay. She pointed down at the grass. The blaze of the sun was sinking over the far horizon behind them, and the shadow creeping up over the ground, swallowing up the long shadows of the stones. But across the harbour, the rock on the other headland, higher up and longer exposed to the sun, still shone bright like a beacon. Barney whooped with a delight. We've got it! We've got it! He thwacked one hand against the hard, warm rock of the standing stone, 
and whirled around in a circle. We're on the first step. Isn't it fabulous? Only the first step, though, Simon said. But pleasure was bubbling within him as well. They all feel three felt suddenly enormously energetic. But we've started, and we know where to go for the next clue now. We go from here. Barney ran his hand over the surface of the standing stone. From this one. But where? Simon said, determined to be realistic. And how? We shall just have to look at the map again. It's bound to tell us. I mean, really, the first clue was marked plain as plain. How to get from one from the other headland over to the over to the stone here, if only we'd known how to understand it. Barney ran across to where Simon had dropped his rucksack, flipped the straps open, and fumbled inside, bringing out the grubby brown roll of the manuscript from its case. Look, he said, sitting down with a bump and spreading it out on the grass before him. Here's where the stone's marked. Bring it further up, Simon said, looking over his shoulder. The sun's still on the grass a bit higher up, and you need the brightest light you can, you can get to look at it. Anyway, it'll be warmer. Barney clambered obligingly up the slope, past the massive gray foot of the last and tallest standing stone, to where the grass was still a, still a brighter green than the, in the last golden light of the sun. Simon and Jane followed him, standing on either side so that their own shadows wouldn't, should not darken the faint, indistinct scrawl on the curling parchment. They bent down, intent, staring at the crude, quick outline that was the Cornish man's picture made 900 years before of the standing stones. Miss Withers' voice said behind them, So, you have found a map after all. A great wave of horror enveloped Barney, and he froze, hunched over the manuscript. Jane and S Simon wheeled round in alarm. Miss Withers stood close behind them, higher up on the slope. Her line was dark and menacing against the sunset sky, and they could not see her face. The boy, Bill, appeared sudden, silently behind her and stood at her elbow. The sight of them both poised there filled Jane with panic, and she suddenly felt frightened in the silence and emptiness of the headland. Barney's finger unconsciously curled into his palm, and the edge of the manuscript released, springing back to a closed roll. The faint crackle of its movement sounded like a gunshot in the silence. "'Oh, don't put it away,' Miss Sithers said clearly. "'I want to have a look.' She took a step forward, stretching out her hand, and in, a t and in terror of the flat, expressionless voice, Jane cried out suddenly, Simon! As a dark figure loomed swiftly towards him from the hill, Simon felt himself wake up. Quicker than his own thought, he sprung around, dipped swiftly, and snatched up the manuscript from Barney's knee. And then he was gone, half slithering, half running, down the slanting side of Kenmare Head towards the village. Bill, quickly! Miss Withers snapped. The big, silent figure beside her shot into sudden life, tearing down the hill at Simon's heels. But he was too clumsy for his speed, and in mid-flight at the edge of the slope he stumbled and half fell. He recovered himself almost at once, but not before Simon, running and slipping straight down over the grass and the zigzagging path, had gained thirty yards lead. "'He won't catch him,' Jane said, her voice wavering with excitement. She felt a broad smile of relief spreading over her stiff cheeks." "'Run it, Simon!' Barney shrilled down the hill, scrambling to his feet. Miss Withers came down towards them, and they drew back from the sight of her face, twisted by rage into something frightening and unfamiliar, no longer attractive, no longer even young. She snarled at them. "'You stupid children, tampering with things you don't understand!' She swung away from them and made off down the slope in the same direction that Simon had taken, in a long, quick stride. They watched her angry, erect back cross and recross the slope in, on the zigzag path until she disappeared over the edge of the headland. Come on, Barney said. We've got to find Mary. Simon's going to need help. The dry grass was like polished wood under Simon's feet, giving no grip as he slipped and slithered down the hillside, now on his feet, now flat on his back and elbows, holding one arm up, always to keep the manuscript from damage. Behind him he heard the noise of the boy from the village, slipping and stumbling more heavily, his breath rasping in his throat, an occasional gasping curse as he lost his footing and fell. Facing outwards across the harbor as he ran down, Simon felt that he could almost jump straight out into the sea. The slope seemed much steeper than when they had climbed up by the path, dropping below him in an endless green curve. His heart was thumping wildly, and he was too intent on getting away to imagine what might happen if the boy caught up with him. But gradually, minute by minute, 
the panic at the pit of his stomach was disappearing. Everything depended on him now, to keep the manuscript safe and get away. He was almost enjoying himself. This was something that he could understand. It was like a race or a fight at school, himself against the boy Bill. And he wanted to win. Panting as he glanced over his shoulder, the boy seemed to be gaining on him a little. Simon flung himself down the rest of the slope, sliding and bumping on his back, alarmingly fast now, and again coming to his feet for a couple of staggering steps. And then, suddenly, he was at the bottom of the slope, stumbling and gulping for breath. With a brief glance up at the pursuing Bill, who yelled and glared at him as he saw him looking around, Simon was off and away over the field, running like a hare and feeling confidence surge stronger as he ran. But he could not lose the boy behind him. Stronger, bigger, and longer-legged, the village boy pounded after him with grim, grim determination, striding more heavily, but never losing ground. Simon made for a stile in the hedge at the far side of the field and leapt over it, gripping the shaky wooden bar at the top with one hand. He came out at the other side yeah, into a quiet lane pitted with the deep, dry ruts, hard as rock, lined with trees and arching overhead with a thick-leaved roof. With the sunlight quite gone now, it was half dark under the branches, and both ends of the lane vanished within a few yards into impenetrable shadow. Simon looked wildly up and down, clutching the manuscript and feeling the sweat damp in the palms of his hands. Which way would lead him to the Grey House? He could no longer hear the sea. Making a blind choice, he turned right and ran up the lane. Behind him, he heard the clatter of the boy's boots climbing over the stile. The lane seemed never-ending as he ran, dodging light-footed from side to side to avoid the ruts. Every Round every bend there stretched another, curving on the gloom... Curving on in a gloomy tunnel of branches and banks with no break anywhere into a gateway or another field. He could hear the feet of the boy hear the beat of the boy's feet behind him on the hard, dry mud of the lane. The boy shouted nothing now, but pounded along in grim silence. Simon felt the thread of panic creep back into his mind, and he ran more wildly, longing to get out of the cavernous lane and into the open air. Then, facing him round the next bend, he saw the sky, bright after the gloom. Then, facing him round the next bend, he saw the sky, bright after the gloom, and within moments he was out again, running on a paved road qu past quiet walls and trees. Again, he turned automatically, without time to think where he was going, and the rubber soles of his sneakers padded softly along the deserted road. The long, high, gray wall along one side and the hedge of the field on the other gave no sign to tell him where he was running. More slowly now, he knew, for try as he might, he was beginning to tire. He began to long for someone, anyone, to appear walking along the road. The boy's footsteps rang more loudly behind him now. Over the quiet evening twitter of birds hidden in the trees, the sound of the feet was so much noisier than his own. The sound of the feet so much noisier than his own gave Simon the beginnings of an idea. And when at last the road branched off, he put in he put on a desperate burst of speed and ran down the side, turning. The wall ended at two battered gateposts through which he glimpsed an overgrown drive. Further down the road, he caught the sight of the rising tower of Troisic Church, and his heart sank as he realized how far he was from home. The boy Bill had not turned the corner yet. Simon could hear his steps gradually growing louder from the main road. Quickly, he slipped inside the deserted gateway of the long drive and wriggled into the bushes, which grew in an unruly tangle beside the gatepost. He jumped with pain as the thorns and sharp twigs stuck into him from all sides but he crouched quite still behind the leaves, trying to quiet his gasping breaths, certain that the pounding of his heart must be audible all up and down the road. The idea worked. He saw Bill, disheveled and scarlet, pause at the end of the road, peering up and down. He looked puzzled and angry, listening with his head cocked for the sound of feet. Then he turned and walked slowly toward Simon's hiding place down the side of the road, glancing back uncertainly over his shoulder. Simon held his breath and crouched further back into the bushes. 
Unexpectedly, he heard a noise from behind him. Turning his head sharply, wincing as a fat purple fuchsia blossom bobbed in his eye, he listened. In a moment, he recognized the sound of feet. Oof. The sound of feet crunching on gravel, coming towards the road down the drive. The gaps of light through the branches darkened for an instant as the figure of a man passed very close to him, walking down the drive and out through the gateway. Simon saw that he was very tall and had dark hair, but he could not see his face. The figure wandered idly out into the road. Simon saw now that he was dressed in all black, long, thin, black legs like a heron and a black silk jacket with the light glinting silverly over the shoulders. The boy Bill's sullen face brightened as he caught sight of the man, and he ran forward to meet him in the middle of the road. They started talking, they stood talking, but out of earshot, so that Simon could hear the voices, but only as an indistinct low blur. Bill was waving his hands and pointed back behind him to the road, and then down the drive. Simon saw the tall, dark man shake his head, but still could not see his face. Then they both turned back towards the drive and began to walk in his direction, Bill still talking eagerly. Simon shrank nervously back into his hiding face, place, feeling suddenly more frightened than he had since the chase began. This was no stranger to Bill. The boy was smiling. This man was someone he had recognized with relief, someone else on the enemy side. He could see nothing but the leaves before his face, and did not dare move forward to peer through the gap, but the footsteps ringing on the metalled road outside did not change to the crunch of gravel. They went past, outside the wall, and up, and on up the road. Simon heard the murmur of voices, but could not distinguish, but could distinguish nothing except one phrase when the village boy raised his voice. Got to get in, she said. Surely the right one. Now I've lost. Lost me, Simon thought, thought Simon with a grin. His terror faded as their footsteps died away, and he began to feel triumphant about having outwitted the bigger boy. He glanced down at the manuscript in his hand and gave it a conspiratorial squeeze. There was silence again now, and he could hear nothing but the song of birds in the approaching dusk. He wondered how late it was. The chase seemed to have lasted for a week. The muscles of his legs began to nag protestingly at their long, cramped stillness. But still he waited, straining his ears for any sound showing that the man and the boy were still near. At last, he decided that they must have gone out of sight and down the road. Clutching the manuscript firmly, he parted the bushes before his face with one hand and stepped out into the drive. No one was there. Nothing moved. Simon tiptoed gingerly across the gravel and peered up and down around the gatepost. He could see no one, and with growing cheerfulness, he crossed from the gateway to make his way back to the road from which he had come. Having a cat on your lap is very warm. I might have to tilt my camera down more in later ones so that you guys can see at least his like ears or something. I feel like he's the true star of this channel. <laughs> it was not until he was several paces out in the open that he saw the boy Bill and the dark man standing together beside the wall fifteen yards. 50 yards away in clear view. Simon gasped and felt his stomach twist with panic. For a moment he stood there, uncertain whether to bolt back into the shelter of the drive before they could see him. But, as he hesitated, mes mesmerized, Bill turned his head, shouted and began to run, the man with him, realizing... And the man with him, realizing, turned to follow. Simon swung round and dashed for the main road. The silence all round seemed suddenly as menacing as the leaf-roofed lane had been. He ached for the safety of crowds, people, and cars, so at least he could lose the awful sensation of being alone, with feet pounding after him in Im in implacable implacable pursuit. Down the side road, around the corner, and along the wall of the churchyard, faster, faster, Simon's heart sank as he ran. His legs were stiff after the cramped paws in the bushes, and his whole body was very tired. He knew that he would not be able to last much longer. A car passed him, traveling fast in the opposite direction. Wild thoughts flickered through Simon's mind as he felt... Uh, 
<sighs> Wild thoughts flickered through Simon's mind as he felt the road beating hard through his thin rubber soles. He could shout and wave at a car, perhaps, or run for refuge into one of the little houses that were fringing the road as he neared the village. But the boy Bill had a man with him now, and the man could tell some story to any stranger Simon approached, and the stranger would probably believe that instead. Stop! A deep voice called behind him. Desperately, Simon tried to fling himself forward faster. Everything would be over if they caught him. They would have the manuscript. They would have the whole secret. There would be nothing left to do. He would have broken the trust. He would have let Gamari down. His breath began to come in great, painful gasps, and he staggered as he ran. There was cross. There was a crossroads ahead. The fast, distinctive footsteps behind him sounded louder and louder. Almost he heard his pursuer's breath in his ears. He heard the boy call a note of triumph. Quick! Now! The voice was further away than the footsteps. He must be the man who was behind him, almost at his heels, his feet thudding nearer, nearer. Simon's ears were singing with the fight for breath. The crossroads loomed ahead, but he could hardly see it. He heard half-consciously the noisy roar of a car's engine, very near, but it barely registered in his weary brain. There was a rattle and a squeak of brakes. Halfway across the crossroads, he almost collided with the rusting hood of a big car. Simon slithered to a halt and made a dodge around, only aware of the... Simon slithered to a halt and made to dodge around it, aware only of the danger at his heels. Then, as if the darkening twi twilight sky were once more suddenly flooded with sunlight, he realized Gamari was leaning from the window of the car. The car's engine revved up again with thunderous, with a thunderous roar. The other side! Get in! Gamer Great Uncle Mary yelled at Simon through the window. Sobbing with relief, Simon stumbled around the back of the big estate car and wrenched at the handle of the door to the other side. He collapsed into the creaking seat and pulled the door shut as Great Uncle Mary let in the clutch and slammed his foot down on the accelerator. The car leapt forward, jerking around the corner, and then they were down the road and away. I brushed enough hair off this cat for whatever. Uh, yesterday to create a whole nother cat his size and yet he continues to shed I love you Gulliver but this is ridiculous Oops, sorry about that these chapters are so long Um, yeah, that's 30 pages. Damn. We're gonna do it, but uh, if my voice by the end of this kind of sucks, I'm sorry. I just feel bad only doing one chapter at a time with 30 minute videos. It feels wrong. Chapter 8. But how did you know where to come? Simon said as Great Uncle Mary changed gear noisily at the foot of the hill up to the grey house. I didn't really. I was just driving around the village hoping I should find you. I left as soon as Jane and Barney came tumbling back into the house. Poor mites, they were in a dreadful state. Rushed into the drawing room and grabbed me bodily. <laughs> Your parents were rather amused. They seem to think we're playing some great private game. Great Uncle Mary smiled grimly. Gosh. It was lucky you had chose that road to drive along, Simon said. I've never been so glad to see anybody in my life. Well, you must remember I know Tre was sick. When the children said they hadn't been able to find you on the path back to the house, I knew there was only one way you could have gone. You came out into Pentreath Lane, didn't you? There was a lane, Simon said. I was shut in by trees. I didn't really have time to check what it was called. Great Uncle Mary chuckled. No, I dare say not. Anyway... I gambled on your turning out of that lane onto the gray onto the nah. Anyway, I gambled on your turning out of that lane onto the main Trigoni Road, which in fact you did. Good job you didn't go the other way. 
Why? Simon said, remembering the blind choice he had made at the lane, with the boy scrambling over the tile over the stile behind him. In the other direction, that lane is a dead end, leads up to the Pentreath farm. If you can call it a farm, it's been hopelessly neglected for years. Mrs. Polk's no good brother lived there. Lives there, young Bill Hoover's father. So does the boy himself when he bothers to go home, which I gather isn't very often. But on the whole, it would have been a very healthy place. It wouldn't have been a very healthy place for you to run to. Golly. Simon felt cold at the thought. Well, never mind. You didn't, anyway. Great Uncle Mary stopped the car with a final rattle and roar. And heaved at the handbrake. Here we are. Safe home. Now you run along in and clean yourself up before your mother sees you. There's some friend of hers coming to sump supper, luckily, so she'll be shut up in the drawing room. Out you get. I'll put the car away. And Simon? Simon, halfway out the door with the manuscript, clutched to his breast, paused, and looked back. He could only just see Great Uncle Mary's face, his ruffled white hair turned to a dark tangle by the shadow, and a light from and light from the street lamp up the hill reflecting eerily back to make his eyes two glinting points of the dark. It was very well done, Great Uncle Mary said quietly. Simon said nothing but slammed the door, feeling suddenly more grown up than he ever had before. And when the car had coughed on up the hill, he forgot all his weariness and crossed the road holding his back very straight. Jane and Barney were at the door before he had one foot on the step. They hustled him inside and toward the stairs. Did he catch you? You still caught it. Oh, well done. We thought you'd get beaten up. This was Barney, wide-eyed and solemn. You didn't get hurt, did you? What happened? Jane ran her eyes criti critically over Simon like a doctor. I'm all right. There was a sudden bright streak of light in the hall as the drawing room door opened. Mother called over a murmur of voices from inside. Is that you, children? Yes, Jane called across the banisters. Supper's nearly ready. Don't be long. Come straight down when you're washed. All right, mother. The door closed again. They're all talking like anything in there. <laughs> They're all talking like anything in there, Jane said to Simon. Mother and father met some long-lost friend in the harbor, and it turns out she lives in Penzance. I think she paints, too. She's staying for supper. She seems quite nice. Did he chase you for miles? Hundreds of miles, Simon said. He yawned. Hundreds and hundreds. And then Great Uncle Mary turned up, just when I was going to get caught. We sent him out after you, Barney said eagerly. They went up the stairs. If we didn't send him, Jane said reprovingly, he went, like a rocket, as soon as he heard what had happened. Well, he wouldn't have gone if, you, if we hadn't told him, and then Simon wouldn't have got rescued. Barney was glowing with excitement. He would have given his ears to have been the hero of the chase. We didn't know which way you'd gone. We tailed Miss Withers for a bit, but she just went down the headland and sat down on the grass at the bottom, looking out at the sea. His voice rose to an incredulous squeak. So we rushed home, and Great Uncle Mary was just back from fishing. We were jolly glad to see you getting out of the car, he said. Une he added unexpe unexpectedly. <laughs> Not half so glad as me, Simon yawned again and rubbed his forehead. I do feel mucky. It must have been when I hid in those bushes. Come on, I can tell you while I wash. First, they were too busy eating to talk, and then towards the end of supper, too busy trying to fall asleep. So all three children were grateful when Miss Hatherton was there. She was a small, bright, pouncy person, quite old, with cropped gray hair and twinkling eyes. She was a sculptress, f a famous one, Great Uncle Mary told them afterwards, and had taught mother when she was a student at art school. She also seemed to have a passion for catching sharks, and at the supper table she alternated between enthusiastic discussions of art with mother and fishing with father. The children listened with interest and were relieved when Mrs. Polk brought the coffee in and mother, who had not missed their yawns, sent them to bed. Nothing like Cornish air to send you to sleep, Miss Hatherington said cheerfully as they pushed back their chairs and said good night. If any of these follow in your footsteps, she added to Mother, it'll be that one, she pointed disconcertingly at Barney. Barney blinked at her. What do you want to be when you grow up, young man? she asked him. I'm going to be a fisherman, Barney said promptly, with a big boat like the white heather. Miss Hatherton roared with laughter. You tell me that in ten years' time, she said, and I shall be very surprised. Good night. I'll buy your first picture. She's dotty, 
She's dotty, Barney said as they went upstairs. I don't want to be a painter. Never mind, Simon said. She's nice. Don't go, Jane. Come into our room for a minute. I think Mary's coming up. He made a sort of face at me as I closed the door. They waited, and in a few moments, Great Uncle Mary appeared in the doorway. I can't stay more. I can't stay more than a minute, he said. I am engaged in the beginnings of what promises to be a long and heated discussion with Miss Hatherington and your mother over the relative merits of Caravaggio and Salvador Rosa. Coo said Barney. As you say, Barnabas. Coo. I rather think I am out of my class with those two. However. Gamary, we found it, Jane said eagerly. We found the second step, and we've started properly now. It's one of the standing stones on Camer Head. The boys did it between them, really. She added honestly. Come on, Simon, get the manuscript out. Simon got up and retrieved the telescope case. Grubbier and more battered now than it had been from the top of the wardrobe. They laid the scroll out on the bed and showed it, and showed Great Uncle Mary the rock where it had all begun and the small, rough sketch of the sun, and how they had worked their way to the standing stone. But we can't tell which standing stone it is on the map, Simon said, because they don't look the same here as they do, as they actually do on the headland. They all bent over the drawing that they still could not help calling a map. Great Uncle Mary looked in silence. Good Mary, Jane said tentatively, an idea she could not quite grasp beginning to chase about her brain. Would he have done the whole thing on the same system, do you think? Whatever do you mean, Simon said, bouncing flat on his back on the bed. Well, you remember when we were trying to work out the first bit, and I said it ought to be the way all treasure maps start, six paces to the east or something. And you said, no, it might be done by getting one thing in line with another, a sort of pointer. Well? Well... Does that mean that you have to get every step in line with something else, at every step? Are all the clues going to be the same kind of clue? You mean, shall we have to get something else in line with the standing stones? Great Uncle Mary was still gazing at the map. It's possible. What makes you think so? That. That, she point Jane said. She pointed at the map. Everyone peered. I can't see anything, Barney said querously. Look, there, over the end of Kemmer Hill. But that's just another of those blodges, Simon said in disgust. How can that mean anything? Doesn't it remind you of anything else? No, Simon said. He lay back again and yawned. Great Uncle Mary looked from one to the other and smiled to himself. Oh, really, Jane said, exasperated. I know you've done jolly well today, and I know you're tired, but honestly... I'm listening, Barney said at her elbow. What about the blodge? It's not a blodge at all, Jane said. At least I don't think so. It's a bit smudged, but it's a circle, a properly drawn one. And I think it means something. It looks just like the other one. The one over the standing stones that turned out to be the setting sun. Simon propped himself on his elbows and began to take an interest again. Jane went on, thinking aloud. The way the first clue worked. We had to find the stone that was in line with the sun. And the rock we started from. Excuse me, sir, what are you doing? You're poking my leg. What? He sees a fluff of his hair moving at me. Okay. My cat is, is a cat. I was going to say he's weird, but no, that's a pretty typical cat thing. He's being... Um, at least he's not going to be shedding on me anymore. Uh, where was I? Jane went on, thinking aloud. The way the first clue worked, we had to find the stone that was in line with the sun and the rock we started from. And then we had to go to the stone and check that it was the right one by the shadow. Well, perhaps now we have to do the same thing. Find something that's in line with the stone and then go to it and see if its shadow points back at to the stone. Great Uncle Mary said softly, The signs that wax and wane but do not die... Jane turned to him eagerly. That's it! That's what he said, isn't it? In the manuscript. There must be all sorts of clues in the writing, as well as in the drawing. Only they're even more buried because we don't know how to get at them. The shadow, 
This shadow business, Simon said doubtfully. Couldn't it be simpler than the way you just said? Perhaps all we have to do is find out what shadow of our standing stones points at it. But it points, but it points back at the place we started, Barney said, because he didn't use it as his first clue. His first clue was, look and see what's between you and the setting sun. The shadow was just our way of proving it. Well, it doesn't have to be a shadow made by the setting sun this time. That's where my blodge comes in, Jane said. Barney said sleepily. Perhaps it's the rising sun. Only it can't be. It isn't in the right place. No, Simon said. Of course it isn't. It's just a blodge. Oh. Jane sputtered with impatience and glared at him. Oh? Why does it have to be the sun at all? Great Uncle Mary was still sitting silently, statuesque on the edge of the bed. He said again lovingly to himself, The signs that wax and wane, but do not die. Simon gazed at him blankly. Don't you see? Jane almost howled at him. Isn't the sun, it's the moon! Simon's face began to change like day on a wind, like the sky on a windy day, different expressions chasing one another across it. He looked from Jane to the map to Great Uncle Mary. Mary, he said accusingly, I believe you knew all this time. Is she right? Great Uncle Mary stood up. The bed creaked as he rose. His height seemed to fill the room, the light swinging from the ceiling behind his head, cast his face into shadow and brought back once more to all three of them the old sense of mystery. His great dark figure with a mist of light faintly silver around his head left them silent and awed. This is your quest, he said. You must find the way every time yourselves. I am the guardian, no more. I can take no part and give you no help beyond guarding you all the way. He turned slightly so that the light shone on his face, and then his voice was ordinary again. I imagine you'll need some guarding on this next stage, too. You know what it is now, don't you? Simon said slowly. We have to find which way the shadow of the standing stone points at night under the moon. Barney said matter-of-factly. The full moon. The full moon? Jane's blodge. He drew around it. He drew it round, not crescent-shaped. So it must mean the full moon. What's it like now? You are not going up to the headland to look at the moon tonight, Great Uncle Mary said firmly. No, I didn't really mean that. I don't think I could manage it anyway. Simon stifled another yawn. I wondered whether the moon was full or not now. We should have to wait for ages if it were all thin and new. It's full tonight, Jane said. I could see it shining through my bedroom window, so that means it will be almost as bright tomorrow. Would that do, Gamary? I mean, could we go and look tomorrow night? Before their great-uncle Mary... Before their great-uncle could answer, Simon was sitting up again, looking thoughtful. There's one thing wrong with all of this. If we've got a moon, and that's only just past full, then we've got all the light we ought to have. But the moon changes, doesn't it? I mean, it rises and sets at different times in different places according to the time of year. Well, we're in August now, but how do we know that the Cornish man wasn't working out his clues in the middle of January or April or something when the moon wouldn't look the same as it does to us? You're just being awkward, Barney said. No, said Great Uncle Mary. He's right. But I will say just one thing. I think you will find that this is the right time of year. Call it luck. Call it anything you like, but since you were able to follow the first clue, I think you'll find you're able to follow the rest as well. And yes, Jane, tomorrow night would do very well for looking at the moon and the standing stones. Especially, well, for a reason you don't know yet. Just after you came up, Miss Hathering, Miss Hatherton was asking your parents to go and see her studio in Penzance tomorrow, and to stay the night. Oh, will they go? Wait and see. Go to bed, and try not to put all your faith in the moon. There may be great, greater problems still waiting for you than you think. Mother stood with her hand on the door of Miss Hatherton's small beetle-like car. Now, you sure you'll be all right, she said doubtfully. Oh, mother, of course we shall, Jane said. What could possibly happen to us? 
Well, I don't know. I'm not altogether happy about leaving you with that burglary. That was ages ago now. So long as you don't set the so long as you don't set the place on fire, father said cheerfully. Miss Hatherington had promised to Miss Hatherton I keep on adding an ing in there for some reason. Miss Hatherton had promised to take him shark fishing the next day, and he was as excited as a schoolboy. Don't let them go to bed too late, Uncle Mary, Mother said, getting into the car. Now, don't worry, Ellen, Great Uncle Mary said, paternally from the doorstep, looking like an Old Testament patriarch with the children clustering around them, around him. I shan't have a chance to lead them astray with Miss Polk living in. We shall all probably die of overeating instead. Are you sure you won't come too? Miss Hatherton leant across the steering wheel, blinking in the morning sun. The car lurched slightly as father squeezed himself into the back. Simon handed his fishing rods after him. No, honestly, thank you, he said. It's no, it's no good. You can't tear these three away from Trevisick, father said. I've never seen anything like it. Even trying to get them as far as the next village is like prizing a limpet off a rock. I daren't think that's what's, I daren't think what's going to happen when time comes to go home. Well, well, they know their own minds, and I can't tempt you away, Professor Lyon. Oh dear, Mother said. I'm sorry you, you're stuck with them, Mary. She made a face at the children. Nonsense, Great Uncle Mary said. This is my element. Disgusting place, Penzance, anyway. He scowled horribly at Miss Hatherton, who grinned amiably back. Trippers, ice cream, and little brass piskies. Commercialized. You can keep it. Well, Miss Hatherton said with a grin, starting the engine. Off to the pe pixies. And we'll send you a stick of rock, Professor. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, children. The car moved off, a ragged chorus of farewell following. Goodbye, Miss Polk, Mrs. Polk shrilled, appearing suddenly behind them on the doorstep, waving a tea cloth. The little car chugged up the hill and out of sight. Well, now, isn't that nice, the two of them off, going off together, Mrs. Polk said sentimentally. Quite like old times. I'll be bound before their troubles began. She wagged her tea cloth at the children. Do you mean us? Barney said indignantly. That I do. Proper headache you be. Still, you'll do, I dare say. She vanished, beaming back into the kitchen. Jolly useful, that Miss Hatherton, Simon said with satisfaction. Of course, I hope they have a lovely time and all that, but that does leave the coast clear, doesn't it? That moon, that moonlight shadow, Jane said thoughtfully. You know, I've been thinking. No thinking today, Great Uncle Mary said firmly. We can't do anything until tonight. I've been in the sea since I came down here this year. I haven't been in the sea since I came down here this year. I think you should all take me out for a bathe. Or maybe it is bath? It has an E at the end. I'm going to say... I'm going to go with bath. I think I was wrong the first time. Uh, I think you all should take me down for a, ba a bath. I was going to do it again. For a bath? Barney's voice rose in amazement. That's right. Great Uncle Mary glared down at him through bristling white eyebrows. Do you think I'm too old to swim? Is that it? Er, no, no, not at all, Gamary, Barney said, confused. I just never thought of you in the water, that's all. But what about the map? Jane wailed. We've just got going, Simon said reproachfully. Well, and we shan't stop. We'll spend a nice, quiet day on the beach in the sunshine, Gamary grinned at them. And who knows? Perhaps there'll be a moon tonight. And there, through the windows of the grey house, the moon hung in late, August eve in late August evening when they came back from their day and washing before Miss Polk called them down to supper. The sun had flamed down on the beach all day and they were all tanned. Barney's fair skin was burning an angry red. Oof. But now the moon dominated the sky, a sky deepening after the sun set into a strange gray black with all but the brightest stars dimmed by the milky luminescent, luminous sheen that flowed over sky and sea without seeming to come from the moon, moon at all. Simon said low and excited, it's a perfect night. Hmm, Jane said. She'd been quiet 
She'd been outside to look at the sky and to study nervously the black outline of Khmer Head rising dark and impenetrable behind the house. Like Simon, she was excited, but the old unease was back as well. It would be better, she told herself severely, not to think about the dark, or at least to think of it as the same dark in, the, in which the long-ago Cornishmen worked out the clues that they were following. But perhaps in this darkness, too, there still lurked the evil which had been creeping up on him then from the unfriendly east, threatening the grail as he th sought urgently for a hiding place. Perhaps it was waiting for them out there. Why was there no light burning in the Withers' yacht? Oh, stop it, Jane said aloud. What? said Simon in surprise. Nothing. I was talking to myself. Oh, good. There's the bell. Come on. Mrs. Polk, in the intervals of carrying heaped plates from the kitchen and empty ones back out again, was in a very firm, motherly mood. Great Uncle Mary had told her that they were going night fishing off the outer harbor, and at once she had been laying great plans for filling thermos flasks with, thermos flasks with hot coffee and leaving plates of sandwiches ready to, in the kitchen for their return. But she would not hear of Barney going too. You not go. You. It is. It is with an M. You not going anywhere with. With sunburn like that, my dear, it wouldn't be sensible now. You stay here with me, with me, and have a nice early night. That'd be the best thing by far. If you go out, you'll be rubbing and blistering quick as anything, and then you'll find yourself in bed tomorrow when you could be out in the sunshine. You wouldn't like that, would you? I should be perf. I should be perfectly all right, Barney said half-heartedly. Just like too proper of a British accent ever come out of you and it just sounds terrible especially when it's supposed to be a child I should be perfectly all right thank you I don't know Barney said half-heartedly Mrs. Polk had painted calamine on his sunburned legs but they were very sore and tender and although he tried to hide the pain he winced every time he took a step and he was very sleepy after the day spent running and swimming in the open air great uncle Mary said I think it would be best, Barney. If you're awake, we'll come and report to you when we get in. That he won't, Miss Polk said. She treated Great Uncle Mary for all her respect for the professor with exactly the same indulgent strictness that she did Simon, Barney, and Jane. He'll have a good long sleep, undisturbed, till morning. And then he'll wake up fresh as a daisy with all that soreness gone, and he can hear all about everything then. Mrs. Polk, Great Uncle Mary said meekly, you are a good soul, and you remind me overwhelmingly of my old nanny, who would never let me go outside without taking my galoshes. Well, young Barnabas, I think. Oh, all right, Barney said sadly. I suppose so. I'll stay here. That's right, Mrs. Polk beamed. I'll go and make ye a nice hot drink before bed. She bustled out of the room. You lucky things, Barney said enviously to Simon and Jane. I bet you find all sorts of marvelous clues. Just because I can't come. It isn't fair. As a matter of fact, you'll have the most important job of all tonight, Simon said impressively. And the most dangerous, too. We decided it would be too risky to take the map with us, with us, so you'll be in charge of it here. You might have to guard it with your life. Suppose the burglars come back again. Oh, don't, Jane said in alarm. That isn't very likely. Don't worry, Great Uncle Mary said, getting to his feet. But it's a responsibility all the same, Barney. So you aren't altogether out of things. Barney wasn't sure whether to feel important or pathetic, so he went obediently to bed. Looking back as they set off into the dark, they saw his face pressed white against one of the upstairs windows, a dim hand waving them goodbye. Gosh, it's cold, Jane said, shivering slightly as they went up the road away from the village. You'll be all right once we get once we've been walking for a bit, Great Uncle Mary said. 
He had insisted before they went out that they should wear sweaters and scarves under their coats, and they were grateful now. Everything seems terribly big, Simon said suddenly. They all spoke softly by instinct, for there was no sound in the dark night but the soft tread of their own feet. Only occasionally they heard a car humming past in the village, and very faint the wash of the sea and the creak of the boats at their moorings in the harbour below. Jane looked round at the silver roofs and the patches of black shadow cast by the moon. I know what you mean. You can only see one edge of everything. There's always one side in shadow, so you can't see where it ends, and... The headland looks awfully sinister. I'm glad I'm not on my own. This is a confession she would never have made in the daylight, but somehow in the dark it seemed less shameful. Simon said unexpectedly, So am I. Great Uncle Mary said nothing. He walked along beside them in silence, very tall, brooding, his face lost in the shadows. With every long stride he seemed to merge into the night, as if he belonged to the mystery and the silence and the small, nameless sounds. Round the corner of the road, away from the harbour, they turned off and climbed over a fence onto the headland. The road curved round inland again, and above them stretched the dark, grassy sweep of the slope, up towards the standing stones. In a while they had found the footpath, and began the long to-and-fro climb to the top. Listen, Jane said suddenly, stopping in mid-stride. There was no sound as they stood there, but only the sigh of the sea. You're hearing, thing you're hearing things, Simon said nervously. You know, I'm sure. Above their heads, from the top of the headland, still out of sight, there came a drifting, ghostly call. Ooh. Oh, Jane said in relief, only an owl. Horrible, I couldn't think of what it was. Great Uncle Mary said nothing. They began to climb again. Then all at once they hesitated, as if by unspoken agreement. A curtain seemed to have come down all round them. What is it? The clouds come over the moon. Look, it's only a little one. Like a puff of smoke, the cloud drifted away from the face of the moon suddenly as it had come, and the land and sea were silver again. You said there wouldn't be any... Any clouds. Well, well, there isn't much, only a few little ones. The wind has changed, Great Uncle Mary said. His voice, out of his long silence, sounded very deep. It comes from the southwest. Cornwall's wind brings clouds sometimes, and sometimes other things. He went up the hillside. They did not like to ask him what he meant. As they climbed after him, more clouds came up, ragged and silver-edged in the moonlight, scudding swiftly across the sky as if another wind were up there, stronger and more purposeful than the gentle breeze blowing down into their faces over the slope. Then and then... Looming over the dark brow of the headland, they saw the outline of the standing stones. Magnified by the darkness, they towered mysteriously against the silver-washed sky and vanished unnervingly into shadow whenever a cloud rushed over the face of the moon. In the daylight, the stones seemed tall, but now they were immense, dominating the headland and all of the dim moonlit valleys that stretched inland from the lights of the village twinkling faintly below. Simon... Uh, Jane clutched at Simon's arm, suddenly overawed. I'm sure they don't want us here, she said unhappily. Who don't? Simon demanded, Bravo making his voice louder than he intended. Who don't? Simon demanded, Bravado making his voice louder than he intended. Shh! Don't make such noise. Oh, grow up, Simon said roughly. He did not feel happy in the dark emptiness of the night, but he was determined not to think about it. Then he felt a uh, coldness at the pit of his stomach as his great uncle's deep voice came back to them in a way that seemed to in that seemed to confirm all Jane sel felt. They won't mind, Great Uncle Mary said softly. If anything, we're welcome here. Simon shook himself slightly, pretending not to have heard. He looked round at the stones surrounding them now. He, surrounding them now, rearing up against the sky. This is the one. He crossed to the stone they had found the day before. I remember this sort of funny hole in the side. Jane joined him, calmed by his matter-of-fact tone. Yes, that's it. When we looked across from here, we were absolutely in line with the sun and that rock we started from, over on that headland. Funny, you can't see it now. I'd have thought the moon would shine on it like the sun did. 
The moon's in another direction, out over the sea, Simon said. Look at the shadow. Come on, that's what we've got to follow. Oh, bother, Shane said as another cloud crossed the moon, and they were left in the dark again. The clouds are getting much thicker. I'd wish, I wish they'd go away. There seems to be so much more wind he up here, too. She clutched her duffel coat round her and tucked her scarf in more tightly. Don't be long, Great Uncle Mary said suddenly out of the darkness. He was standing against another of the stones, swallowed up in its outline so that they could not even make out his shape. Jane felt a shiver of alarm in return. Why? Is anything wrong? No, nothing. Look, here's the moon again. The night became silver again. Looking up, it was as if they saw the moon sailing through the clouds instead of the other way around, racing smoothly across the sky, passing puffs and wisps of cloud on either side, and yet never moving from its place. Simon said in flat, dull disappointment, it doesn't point at anything. He stared at the ground beside the towering stone. Dark on the silvered gloom of the grass lay the shadow cast by the high, bright moon. It pointed like a blunt finger away from Kenmare Hill toward the long, dark inland horizon of the Cornish Moors. Perhaps it points to some landmark we haven't noticed, Jane said doubtfully, gazing in vain over the shadow-massed hills. <sighs> More likely, the Cornishman used the landmark that's fallen down or been destroyed, or just crumbled away. Away. There's always been that risk, and it wouldn't mean we could never- and it would mean we could never get any further than this. But he wouldn't have done that. I know he wouldn't. Jane looked wildly round her into the night, into the wind gusting over the bleak headland, and then suddenly she stood still and stared. From her place beside the great stone that was their only sure mark, she turned her head to the moon that raced motionless high over the top of Kemmer head, over the sea. She saw, for the first she saw, as if for the first time, the pathway of light that it laid down. Straight as an arrow, the long white road of the moon's reflection stretched towards them across the surface of the sea, like a path from the past and a path to the future as its edges danced and glimmered as the waves beneath the wind and where it ended, at the tip of Kemmer Head, a clear, dark silhouette stood against the shining sea-carried light. She turned to Simon. She said to Simon huskily, Look. He turned to see, and she knew that in a moment he was certain as she was that this was where they were supposed that this is what they were supposed to find. It's those rocks it's those rocks at the end of the headland, she said outline there. It must be. And we weren't supposed to use a shadow as a pointer this time. We were to stand here by this stone and let the moonlight itself show us the next clue. And that's what it does, Simon's voice rose as the familiar excitement of the chase came flooding back. And if that's what he meant by the signs that wane but do not die, then the grail must be hidden somewhere in that clump of rocks, buried in the end of Kemmer Head. Gosh, Kamiri, we found it! He turned back towards the silent, dominating circle of standing stones and then hesitated. Mary, he said uncertainly. Jane came quickly to stand close to him. Out of the shelter of the rock, the wind blew her ponytail round across her face. She ca called more loudly. Gamary, where are you? There was no answer but the rise and fall of sighing wind, loud enough now to drown out the distant murmur of the sea. Jane, feeling very small indeed under the ghostly group of great stones, took hold of Simon's sleeve. Her voice quavered in spite of, it, in spite of itself. Simon, where's he gone? Simon called into the growing wind. Great Uncle Mary, Great Uncle Mary, where are you? But still, there was nothing but the darkness, and the high white moon sailing now dark, now light, and the noise of the wind. They heard the husking wail of the owl again, nearer this time over the headland in the opposite valley, a friendless, inhuman, desolate sound. Jane forgot everything but the loneliness of the dark. She stood speechless with, with fright, as if she knew a great wave were bearing down on her, and she could not move out of its path. If she had not been there with, if she had not been there, Simon would have been as paralyzed by fright himself. But he took a deep breath and clenched his fist. He was over there, before he said, swallowing. Come on. He moved in the direction of the other standing stones, barely visible now in the blackness. 
Oh no, Jane's voice rose hysterically as she clutched his sleeve. Don't go near them. Don't be stupid, Jane, Simon said coolly, sounding much braver than he felt. Another owl hooted unexpectedly on their other side towards the end of the headland. Oh, Jane said miserably, I want to go home. Come on, Simon said again. He must be over here. I expect he can't hear us. This wind's getting up like anything. He took Jane's hand, and unwillingly she moved with him towards the dark looming shapes of the standing stones. The moon dimmed and disappeared into the depths of a bigger cloud, so that only a dim luminous glow from the stars gave shape to anything at all. They went gingerly through the darkness, feeling that at any moment they might collide with something unseen, panic suppressed only by the desperate hope of finding their great uncle suddenly at their side. He seemed a very strong and necessary refuge now that he was not there. They were right among the standing stones now, and they could feel rather than see the black rock pillars rearing up around them. The wind blew gustily, singing through the grass, and again they heard the owl cry below them out of the dark. They moved slowly together, straining their eyes to peer ahead. Then the rag cloud turned silver again, and the moon came sailing out through the flying wisps at its edge. And in the same moment, they came aware, became aware of a dark, of a tall, dark shape looming up before them, where no stone had been before. It seemed to swell as the wind blew, so that suddenly they saw that it was no stone, but the tall figure of a man in all black, a long coat that swirled in the wind as he turned towering over them. For a moment, the moonlight caught his face as he turned, and they saw eyes shadowed under dark, jutting brows and the flash of white teeth in what was not a smile. Jane screamed, terrified, and, her, and hid her face in Simon's shoulder. And then, at once, the moon was covered up, was covered again by a cloud, and the threat and the roar of the darkness seemed to rear up all around them. Without a wo word, they swung round and ran, stumbling, driven by panic, away from the silent standing stones down the hill, until in enormous flooding relief they heard the call of a familiar deep voice. As they looked ahead, gasping, they saw Great Uncle Mary silhouetted against the lighter background of the sea, standing before them in the pa on the path. They rushed to him. Jane flung her arms round his waist and clung to him, sobbing with relief. Simon had just enough self-possession left to stand on his own. Uncle oh, Mary, he said breathlessly, we couldn't find you anywhere. We must get... Uh. We must go down from here quickly, his great uncle said low and urgently, holding Jane to him and stroking the back of her quivering head. I was looking for you. I know there was, I knew there was something in those cries that was not like an owl. Come quickly. He bent down and picked Jane up in his arms in one swift movement as if she had been a baby, and with Simon close at his heels, that he strode off down the hill, keeping to the path that they could see, that they could just see as moonlight flashed through the racing clouds. Simon said, panting as he trotted along. There was a man up there. We saw him all of a sudden out of the dark. He was all muffled up in a big coat like a cloak, all in black. It was horrible. I went to find them, Great Uncle Mary said. He must have got past me. There were Then there were others. I shouldn't have left you alone. Jane, shaken in his arms as he loped down the hill, opened her eyes and looked back over the shoulder at the top of the headland, where the dark fingers of the standing stones still pointed at the sky, and in a moment before they disappeared over the horizon, she saw that there were twice as many shapes there had been before, with other black figures standing among the stone stones. Camary, they're coming after us! They dare not follow while I am here, Great Uncle Mary said calmly. He went down the slope in the same long, easy stride. Jane swallowed. I think I'm all right now, she said in a small voice. Could you put me down? Hardly pausing, Great Uncle Mary set her on her feet again, and like Simon, she half ran beside him to keep up. They reached the bottom of the slope and crossed the field to the road, feeling it as a reassuring place after the vast, bleak emptiness of the headland. The wind no longer whined round their ears down here, and they heard again the friendly, soft murmur of the sea. That man, Simon said, that man we saw, it was him, Gamary, the one who we'd never seen before. It was the man you rescued me from, the man who chased me with the boy. Jane said in a small, frightened voice, looking straight ahead of her at the twinkling village lights as she walked. But I recognized, but I recognized him straight away, when the moonlight shone on his face. That, that's why I was so scared. 
It was the vicar of Trousick. He's the man who saw my outline of the map in the guidebook. <sighs> all right. And that's all I'm going to be able to do. Because my voice is going to give out. But I hope you enjoyed. And uh, hopefully I will get the, the next chapter out much sooner. So. Have a good one, you guys.